Now there is another thing that is increasing exponentially recently in NLP, which is the requirement for more data. People are using more data for pre-training and people are also using more data for fine tuning. Okay. So there's a problem because um, when you compare two models that was, they were pre-trained on two different data sets of very different size, um, it's really hard to tell if one model is better because it was pre-trained on more data or if it's better because usually of the like novel architectural design that people introduce. A uh, good, good recent example of last year was Excelnet, the, the transformer from, from Google. That was the successor of Transformer Excel. And Excelnet used um, a smart um, autoregressive training. So you could actually do autoregressive training while having um, the possibility to attend to both contexts, to left and the right context. Usually when we do autoregressive auto training, we only go Y way, so our model is masked. The, the like the right context of each token for the model is masked but in excelnet actually they do auto regressive with a random permutation so the model actually learns to pay attention to both contexts now the problem was that excelnet was uh, also trained on a lot more data than bird so when they compared to bird it was really hard to tell what was the difference what was the improvement that came from training on 20 times more data and which, which, imp which improvements came from having this new autoregressive architecture. So there was a huge debate and actually it was kind of settled by Roberta, which was a very simple BERT architecture, just exactly the same as BERT, but just trained on more data basically. And Roberta outperformed Excelnet, which showed that basically there was the bitter lesson of NLP and the bitter lesson of machine learning in general, as uh, Richard Sutton uh, talked about it. Uh, which is that if you have more data, uh, it's usually outperform having uh, a smaller model. Okay. Um, and now there is this recent paper that we're going to talk a lot more about, which is called Scaling Lows for a Neural uh, Language Model. This is a paper from OpenAI, and it was, it's, it's a really in depth study of uh, what happened when you increase the data size and when you increase the model size without changing the architecture. So it's a very good, it's a very good study. Now this is for pre-training, but we see the same on fine tuning, which is that people, when they fine tune, they do a lot of data augmentation. And a good example is the Winograd Schema Challenge. The Winograd Schema Challenge was a very interesting data set for a long time. It's very simple. You just know, see one example here. You have a sentence that say, for instance, the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. And the question is, what was too big? Was it a trophy or was it a suitcase? And the model has to, to do a classification between these two ones, okay? So that's very interesting because you need some common sense. You need to know that suitcase is usually bigger than a trophy. And the way it was solved, and for, for a long time, it was a very hard challenge. It's a very small one. You only have like 300 examples. Um, and for a long time, it was very hard to get good performances for deep learning models on that. And the way it was solved was actually to uh, generate uh, artificial data augmentation data sets with some heuristics, extracting from Wikipedia sentences where you have two times the same noun, like two times trophy, and replacing one of them by it. Like this, you can build with these heuristics, you can build a huge data set from any, any like uh, crawled text data set. And you can pre-train your model on that and then do this fine tuning on, uh, on the Winograd schema challenge after that. And you can solve the task, but you can see that it's not very, uh, we're not really happy about that because uh, scientifically we have not really learned anything about common sense by doing that, okay? We've just learned that more data is better. So let's talk a bit more about pre-training first, okay? So I talk about the scaling lows paper. Let's go into depth in this paper. So this paper is about one single architecture. It's about the transformer trained for autoregressive uh, language modeling. Okay, so you only have the left context for each token. These are transformers that are trained to predict the next token given the, the, um, given the beginning of a sentence. This is GPT-2, but they experiment with many sizes, with many sizes of the data sets, and uh, also they did some nice uh, scan on the architecture. There was always some question about transformer, which is what is the optimal ratio of the number of heads with regard to the model size? What are the optimal ratio of the number of layers with regard to the dimension of the models? And I kind of show that all this doesn't really matter. 
as long as you're in a like very flat sweet point where you have this nice um, hyperparameter that was pretty much the original attention is on unit parameter. As long as, you, as you're in this sweet spot, you're good. So these models are very actually robust to this simple uh, hyperparameter uh, exploration. And what they show is that just by scaling uh, model size and scaling the data set size, you have a very clear power law, which means that it's actually exponential, actually. That's what this means. It's exponentially decreasing. So if you double your model size, you have this linear uh, improvement in performances. If you double your data set size, you also have this linear improvement. But this power law, they go over very wide ranges. They go over holders, they went on over orders of magnitude. Now you can read this paper, it's very interesting. They show that two, two interesting things for me. One was that uh, actually, um, that was actually there was a, fa a follow up paper by Eric Wallace at UC Berkeley, which showed that um, it's actually better to have a too big model. It's actually better that your model is uh, more big than we used to that, uh, than we used to, to think. And um, for the data set. So if your model is uh, actually slightly too big for your data set, in the way we were assessing the size of uh, that set on model before, you can actually get better results. You go, you go down, your loss go down faster. And there is another interesting thing in this paper, which is also uh, something we saw a little bit earlier on the pruning, which is that the, um, in these transformer models, the embeddings and the layers, they behave really differently. Okay. So when you, for instance, when you prune, you should prune differently embeddings and layers. And here they show also that uh, it's actually the, the capacity of the model is really defined by the layers and all the power law they observed, they work well if you remove the embeddings, okay? If you don't take into account the embeddings when you compute the size of the model. Okay, uh, now there is a last very interesting thing is that they have two lows for the, the, um, the decreasing loss. Okay, one of the lows, one of the increasing loss, one of the lows to decrease the loss is related to the capacity of the model, when you increase the capacity of the model, and one is related to uh, increasing the data set. Okay. Both, can, uh, um, both can be related together in terms of computation like more data means more computation, bigger model also means more computation. So you can collect these two power low. And what you see on this graph is that you have actually two slopes, which means that at some point they join together and you can't really know, <coughs> you don't really know which loss you should have, okay? You have one loss which is actually defined by or giving, uh, using the optimal data capacity. Um, the optimal data set and one law is defined by using the optimal model capacity and at some point they predict their prediction doesn't fit together uh, which is actually far above what we've been uh, experimenting right now it's around uh, the beta, beta parameters regime and here what they say is that actually the architecture the transformer architecture is breaking down that's what their opinion is okay so all this exploration of more data and bigger models are actually um, related to one idea. The idea is that uh, maybe there will be a qualitative jump in behavior if we get enough data, okay? The idea is like, maybe just getting more data is enough to see a qualitative, like a phase transition in how the model behave. And there is some hints of this. It's, it's a quite a interesting idea, I think. Um, it's very controversial somehow because um, more data, as I was saying, more data or bigger model, is it really a research program, right? Uh, and there's this nice paper from AI2, uh, from um, Alan Talmor and um, uh, people at, um, at AI2 um, um, Israel. They show that actually just comparing BERT and Roberta, you can, you can, you can notice a phase transition, okay? So comparing BERT to Roberta is interesting because they have the same architecture. They are exactly the same models, just that BERT was trained on only 137 billion tokens only, and Roberta was trained on 2.2 tera tokens, okay? So Roberta was really trained on a lot more data. And here you can see this very interesting zero-shot evaluation. So you just take the pre-trained model, you don't fine-tune it, and you ask it questions that are kind of like the, the winner grad schema challenge question, okay? Here you ask it, uh, a 25-year-old person age is mm -mm, then a 30-year-old person. 
and it, the model has to predict if the mm -mm was younger or older. So it has to actually compare numbers together and use some common sense if you want. And you can see that BERT is pretty bad. BERT is the blue curve. And Roberta, which is the green curve, is actually like super good at comparing this number in the, in the range of ages for people. You can see the same uh, on size comparison. If you ask Roberta to compare the size of um, like the sun to a house, a table to a house, things like that, Roberta is usually pretty good out of the box. So it has some form of what we would call common sense. And this is out of the box, okay, just by pre-training. It's also even able to compare birth rate, like birth year, sorry. Like if you ask if somebody was born in this year or this year, who is older, so which means it's the reverse than the age, okay? The year, the higher the, your birth, um, the year of birth was, the, the younger you are. And the model is able to do this sweep, swatch, swap. So that's very actually surprising, I think. Now, um, there is this big question when you do now fine tuning, okay? So we've seen that pre-training, bigger data is just better. And actually you may even see some phase transition. Now what about fine tuning, okay? So fine tuning means you've taken this pre-trained model on their data set, and now you want to adapt them on one task, okay? This paper is a very important one from DeepMind. The evaluating, learning and evaluating general linguistic intelligence. It's a paper that kind of pose a lot of questions. It's an opinion paper and you should definitely read it, I think, if you want. It's one of the most important of last year, last year's paper. It's like now one year old. And what they say is that the recent that said they're actually too easy to solve with leader generalization. Why? Because we have this uh, training data set for the model that are usually often quite big, like MNLI or SNLI or squad. They're really kind of big data set to fine tune on. And they give models um, that actually don't really have a good sample efficiency. So let's let's focus what does this mean. Let's say we have two models. We have model A. Model A, a has a 90% accuracy with like a 100 training example. But then it doesn't get any better with more training example, okay? It's, it can plateau at 90%. Model B takes like 1 million examples to get to 90% accuracy. But then it can increase a little bit and it ends up plateauing at 92%. So if we, do, if we just do like we do usually, like we compare the model at the end of the fine tuning, we would say, oh, model B is a lot better because it can reach 92% accuracy. But actually, we should really reward model A because model A is able to reach a very good score with just 100 training examples. That's really great. That's what we wanted for, for, from transfer learning. Okay? That was one of the initial goals of transfer learning was to make this model work on very small data sets. And this is called sample efficiency. It means how better your model gets with one additional example. There, there are a lot of other problems with these models which are related. One model is that uh, when you fine tune on these big data sets, usually we get models that work well really exactly on the training, uh, on the fine tuning uh, domain. So you have models that work well on squad, for instance, that work well, that means they work well on Wikipedia question answering in this very a narrow field of question answering. But what we would like, for instance, we don't really want squad models. We would like to have question answering models that would work on any question answering task. And this is related to sample efficiency because it means that if you just give a few general question answering um, example, you would like your model to work already well on them. Okay, You would like to the model not to need to fine tune on full Wikipedia to just know question answering Wikipedia. There is a related matrix, uh, matrix which is called online code length, which say that um, how much better your model will get with each um, additional sample. Okay, it's an um, information theory uh, model, uh, metric which actually is related to how, how how much you can compress your model. So it's a very important metric, and it's actually probably the way to go forward. So here, just a few examples. Here you see uh, if a model was uh, actually trained from. So you can see here the benefits of uh, transfer learning first. So here on the bottom, bottom, you see a bird that's trained from scratch on question answering. So this bird is not initialized, is, initial, is randomly initialized, okay? 
So it's pretty bad at the end. You just train on the full square uh, data set and you just don't get very high. Now you can see that if BERT is pre-trained already on uh, like its usual uh, pre-training, uh, which is the Toronto Big Corpus on Wikipedia, it goes up a lot faster. Okay, so this is the benefits of transfer learning and it reaches ni ni nice accuracy. Um, and now if you look at the, the last part, which is actually a bird that was pre-trained on another question answering data set, you can see that it already start very high. So it means that this model is actually very sample efficient because it was already fine-tuned on another question answering task before. Okay, so this model, when you look at them on online metrics, uh, on, on online code length metric, you can see that they're actually very different. Um, because when you actually fine-tune this model, you have to understand the BERT model was pre-trained. Now to fine-tune it, we'll add a linear layer on top. Okay, And this linear layer is randomly initialized. So there is no shortcut here. You will have to train this linear layer. Okay, You cannot really bypass this when you use this model with uh, this task specific uh, layer added on top. You need to train this task specific layer, which means that you can't really have zero shot. Okay, And this model, we always have to catch up somehow. They always need a, a few examples to be able to uh, train this last layer, whatever, whatever small the layer is. This is what we call task specific components. And that's a very strong limit to how we can do a very simple efficient model. Okay, um, now this was just to show you um, when you actually investigate sample efficiency, um, you can see that it's also a good way to see if the model is actually learning the task using the knowledge it had from before or if it's actually learning the task from scratch. So here you see comparison between BERT and Roberta, right? You know that Roberta, we've been showing this uh, blue and green diagram. Diagram Roberta has um, some kind of good common sense, better than bird. Okay, and we can see that because when we fine tune Roberta, it's a lot more sample efficient. With just a few examples, it's already catching up. Uh, it's already getting better metrics than birds. And by comparing the sample efficiency curve, which is the performance of your model while you just use uh, um, um, progressively more more sample to fine tune it. Just by comparing the curve for BERT and Roberta, you can see, actually, you can have a good idea of how much your pre-training was helping to, um, to uh, get good performance on your target task. Okay, so this paper is also a very nice investigation of that. And that's actually uh, posed the, the nice question of how much data should we need? And this actually leads us to, to the next topic, which is in-domain versus out-of-domain. 